Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at stroke for finals. So a stroke is a sudden onset of a rapidly developing focal or global neurological disturbance which lasts for more than 24 hours or leads to death. So this is a very high yield neurology topic which crops up time and time again for finals. So this will be something that we'll discuss in a lot of detail today. So just a brief introduction about the Medicine Guide. The Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel with free online YouTube videos to support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've made videos on how to be successful at medical school, um, specifically looking at how to approach anatomy, CBL, histology, PBL, as well as how to get the most out of hospital and GP placements and how to be successful in clinical OSCEs. I've also made videos focusing on the high yield topics like crop and final exams, such as interpreting images, an obstetrics edition, a paediatrics edition, a cardiology edition, and this video in conjunction with others is part of my high yield neurology edition. So without further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that we'll be discussing the two common forms of strokes. So there's an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. We'll be looking at the risk factors. We'll be discussing signs and symptoms in particular in relation to the Oxford or Bamford classification. And then we'll be looking at test investigations and ultimately the management. So strokes can be categorized as either an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. So 85% of all stroke cases in the UK are identified as an ischemic stroke. So ischemic strokes are far more common than a hemorrhagic stroke. Now an ischemic stroke can arise from a thrombus or an emboli. So an example of a thrombus leading to an ischemic stroke involves cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And examples of an embolus leading to an ischemic stroke involves thromboemboli, typically from emboli dislodged in atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is a major risk factor for an ischemic stroke. Other sources of emboli leading to an ischemic stroke can include a fat embolus, an air embolus, and a septic embolus. So an example of a septic embolus can be the Lipman sac emboli, which are dislodged in patients who suffer from an infective endocarditis because they're sources of septic emboli. Conversely, another form of a stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke, and like I mentioned, this is less common than an ischemic stroke, but still very important and we still need to be aware of this for our exams and also for clinical practice. So a hemorrhagic stroke occurs in 15% of UK cases of stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke can arise from an intracerebral hemorrhage or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So risk factors for an ischemic stroke includes atrial fibrillation, like I mentioned previously, they're a major source of thromboemboli, which can be dislodged. Also, hypertension, smoking, and a necrotic brewery as well. Risk factors for hemorrhagic stroke involves anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. If the patient is suffering from an aneurysm which is ruptured, so a key risk factor would be a patient who has a history of polycystic kidney disease and they have developed a berry aneurysm in the circle of Willis, which is now ruptured. So the rupturing of the berry aneurysm has led to the hemorrhagic stroke. And the underlying risk factor was the fact that they suffer from polycystic kidney disease. Another risk factor leading to hemorrhagic stroke involves AV malformations and also hypertension. Now, there are lots of signs and symptoms of strokes, but the key point to remember is that the signs and symptoms have to be categorised in terms of whether the patient is suffering from a total anterior circulation stroke or a partial anterior circulation stroke or a lacuna, anterior, sorry, a lacuna syndrome or a lack. And finally, a posterior circulation syndrome, so a POC. So I think the key thing to remember when you're learning about signs and symptoms of stroke is that you need to be able to relate it in terms of this Bamford stroke classification or it's sometimes known in textbooks as the Oxford stroke classification. So Oxford or Bamford are terms that are used interchangeably and they refer to the same thing. 
Now, the key thing to remember to differentiate between the TACS, the PACS, LACS with the POCS is the fact that the total partial and lacuna strokes are all involving the anterior circulation, whereas the posterior circulation stroke, the POCS, is involving the posterior circulation. So it's, if it's involving the posterior circulation, the patient only needs to show one of the following symptoms to be identified with posterior circulation syndrome stroke. And this involves a cranial nerve palsy and contralateral motor or sensory deficit, a bilateral motor or sensory deficit, conjugate eye movement disorder like gaze palsy, a cerebellar dysfunction like ataxia and nystagmus vertigo, or an isolated homonymous hemianopia. An example of this is found in the top right hand corner if you have a look. All the patient is suffering from cortical blindness. So that's a posterior circulation stroke. So an anterior circulation stroke can either be total, partial or lacuna. Now if you look at total, you can see that the patient needs to suffer from all three of the following symptoms. So the patient needs to have a unilateral weakness of the face, arm and leg. So it's a complete unilateral weakness and this can either be sensory or motor. They need to suffer from, again, homonymous hemianopia, and they need to suffer from a higher cerebral dysfunction. So examples of this can involve dysphagia, or it can involve visuospatial disorder. So the patient needs to have all three of those symptoms. Whereas in a partial anterior circulation stroke, the patient only needs to show two of those symptoms. And finally, in a lacuna, syndrome stroke, the patient only needs to show one of the following symptoms. So a pure sensory stroke, a pure motor stroke, a sensory motor stroke, or an ataxic hemiparesis. Now we've mentioned higher cerebral dysfunction and we've given examples like dysphagia. Other examples can involve dyspraxia, so that's difficulty planning movements, or dyscalculi, which is difficulty understanding numbers. Okay, so it's a very easy SBA for the examiner to throw in where they've given you an example of a patient suffering from a stroke and they've given a list of potential symptoms that the patient is suffering from and you'll be asked to identify what type of stroke it is. So therefore you need to be very comfortable in using the Bamford stroke classification and I would strongly suggest that you Keep this in mind when you're revising stroke for exams because it's a very easy SBA that they can ask you. Now, in terms of tests and investigations, initially a Rosier test is performed at the hospital admission because it excludes hypoglycemia, because hypoglycemia is a very common stroke mimic. Also, the Rosia test, if the score is greater than zero, then that suggests that stroke is very likely. Now, your first line imaging that you need to perform in a patient presenting with a stroke is a non-contrast CT head because we need to exclude a hemorrhagic stroke. And also, another thing you need to keep in mind is that all antiplatelets need to be withheld until a hemorrhagic stroke is excluded. And a hemorrhagic stroke is excluded by this non-contrast CT head. So it's really important that this is performed first line. MRI with diffuse weighted imaging can be performed because a small ischemic stroke may not be visible on the CT scan. So that's why we need to perform an MRI. So we need to perform an ECG to exclude for any signs of AF. So if you have a look at my cardiology videos, I've discussed the presentation of AF on an ECG in a great amount of detail. But the key, the, the, the key things to remember is that the patient will be presenting with an irregularly irregular rhythm and there will not be any P waves present on an ECG in a patient presenting with AF. And also remember that AF is a very key risk factor for leading to an ischemic stroke. 
Also, an echocardiogram can be performed to exclude for any emboli and any heart valve disease. And a carotid artery duplex ultrasound scan, again, is performed to exclude for any sources of emboli. Now, the management of a stroke is very different if it's an ischemic stroke compared to a hemorrhagic stroke. So initially, we're going to look at the management of an ischemic stroke. So there are lots of different options available to us, and we'll go through this one by one. So firstly, let's consider thrombolysis with IV alteplase. So thrombolysis is offered to patients who are presenting within four and a half hours of symptom onset. And it's very important that an intracranial hemorrhage is excluded by CT, by CT imaging, otherwise thrombolysis would be inappropriate. A thrombectomy can be performed within 24 hours of symptom onset. And thrombectomy is performed in patients who have an acute ischemic stroke and there is a confirmed occlusion of the proximal anterior circulation by CT angiogram or MR angiogram and potentially salvageable brain tissue is shown by CT perfusion or diffuse weighted MRI sequencing showing limited infarct core volume. Now another option would be to perform a thrombectomy and thrombolysis together and this could be performed within 24 hours of symptom onset if an acute ischemic stroke has occurred with confirmed occlusion of the proximal posterior circulation shown by CT angiogram or MR angiogram. So the posterior circulation involves the basilar artery or the posterior cerebral artery. And the second condition is that potentially salvageable brain tissue is shown by CT perfusion or diffuse weight MRI sequencing and, and during an ischemic stroke aspirin is a key aspect of management so aspirin has to be given within 24 hours of symptom onset and an intracranial hemorrhage must be excluded by the CT imaging or the MRI imaging so a daily dose of 300 milligrams of aspirin is given for two weeks and then after the two week therapy of daily 300 milligrams of aspirin, we can consider and use definitive long term antithrombotic treatment. So, if the patient has a safe swallow, so they don't have any dysphagia, we can give them oral aspirin. But if the patient is suffering from dysphagia or has an unsafe swallow, we would offer again 300 milligrams of aspirin, but this would be given rectally or via an enteral tube. Now the management of a hemorrhagic stroke is as follows. So if a patient is also presenting with a hydrocephalus, these patients need to be managed by the neurosurgical team. Otherwise, medical management is offered to patients presenting with hemorrhagic stroke if they have a small deep hemorrhage, if there's a low bar hemorrhage without either hydrocephalus or rapid neurological deterioration, if there's a large hemorrhage and significant comorbidities before the stroke, if the GCS score is less than eight due to the hydrocephalus, or if there's a posterior fossa hemorrhage. And reverse anticoagulation is key in managing a patient with a hemorrhagic stroke, and it's something we need to consider. So it's really important that we return the clotting levels back to normal as soon as possible in patients with a primary interest cerebral hemorrhage who are receiving warfarin prior to their stroke. Now we can reverse warfarin using a prothrombin complex concentrate and also giving IV vitamin K in this situation. Now in terms of managing blood pressure in a patient presenting with a hemorrhagic stroke, this is very key. So we can either offer to rapidly lower the blood pressure or we can consider to rapidly lower the blood pressure. So in situations where we would offer to rapidly lower the blood pressure in a hemorrhagic stroke, 
is when a present is when a patient is presenting within six hours of symptom onset, and their systolic blood pressure is between 115 millimeters per mercury up to 220 millimeters per mercury. So in this situation, we're aiming for a systolic blood pressure of of between 130 to 140 millimeters per mercury within one hour of starting treatment and we want to maintain this blood pressure for at least seven days. Now in other scenarios we would consider rapidly lowering the blood pressure and the scenario is as follow. It's when a patient presents more than six hours of of symptom onset or has a systolic blood pressure greater than 220 millimetres per mercury. And similarly again, we're aiming for a systolic blood pressure reading between 130 to 140 millimetres per mercury within one hour of starting treatment and we need to maintain this blood pressure for at least seven days. Now there are certain scenarios where rapidly lowering the blood pressure is contraindicated in a patient with a hemorrhagic stroke. And this is below. When there's an underlying structural cause such as a tumour, AV malformation or an aneurysm. If the patient is presenting with a GCS score less than 6. If the patient is going to have early neurosurgery to evacuate the hematoma. Or if the patient has a massive hematoma and they have a very poor prognosis. So this marks the end of my stroke video. Hopefully you found that helpful. If you've enjoyed my video today, please can I kindly ask you to give a thumbs up to my video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'd like to take the time to say thank you for watching my video and I wish you all the best with your final exams.